آل محمد اللهم صل على أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لام را تلك آيات الكتاب المبين إنا أنزلناه قرآنا عربيا لعلكم تعقلون نحن نقص عليك أحسن القصص بما أوحينا إليك هذا القرآن وإن كنت من قبله لمن الغافلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحن نقص عليك أحسن القصص بما أوحينا إليك بما وَإِن كُنْتَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ لَمِنَ الْغَافِلِينَ إِذْ قَالَ يُوسُفُ لِأَبِيهِ يَا أَبَتِ شر كوكبا والشمس والقمر رأيتهم لي ساجدين قال يا بني لا تقصص رؤياك على فَيَكِيدُوا لَكَ كَيْدًا إِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ لِلْإِنسَانِ عَدُوٌ مُبِينٌ صَدَقَ اللَّهُ الْعَلِيُّ الْعَظِيمُ اللهم صل وسلم وزد وبارك على رسول الله وآله الأطهار على رسول الله وآله الأطهار صنوات Assalamu alaikum jamian. Inshallah, we'll continue our program 
with the English lecture with Sayyid Saleh Qazwini about the salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wal mursaleen. Habibi ilahi al-alameen. Abil Qasim al-Mustafa Muhammad. Wa ala ahli baytih al-tayyibin al-tahirin. Allahumma salli ala. قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كنتم خير أمة أخرجت للناس تأمرون بالمعروف وتنهون عن المنكر وتؤمنون بالله One of the most important obligations that we all have an obligation upon every single Muslim an obligation upon every single believer is to enjoin the good and forbid the evil. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to be reformers in society. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to look out for the well-being of every member in the community. Whether it is someone I live in the same city, in the same country with, or someone I work with, or someone who lives with me in the house. I have a duty, and every single individual, every single believing Muslim has a duty to enjoin the good and forbid the evil. What does this mean? This means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want us to become passive individuals where when we see wrong, we remain silent and we do not speak. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to stand in front of oppression. Allah wants us to stand in front of anything that we see wrong. To take a stance in life. Because this is the purpose of religion. This is the purpose of faith. Religion is not just between you and God. You go and you pray and you fast and you worship and that's it. No. Your worship and your spirituality has to have an impact on your life. And that will impact your interactions. And that means when you see something wrong, when you see oppression, when you see tyranny in front of your face, you stand against it and you take a stance and you speak out against it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat lil nas ta'muruna bil ma'roof wa tanhawna anil munkar wa tu'minuna billah. You want to be the best ummah? You want to be the best nation? You have to be a nation that enjoins the good and forbids the evil. That means if you see something wrong, that means if you see someone not doing something correctly, that means if you see someone suffering or a nation suffering or a group of people that are in distress, you have to go out and help them. You have to be there for them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلْتَكُنْ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةٌ يَدْعُونَ إِلَى الْخَيْرِ وَيَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ let there be from amongst you a group of people who enjoin the good and forbid the evil. Those are the victorious and successful ones. A lot of us, we think that the obligation of enjoining the good and forbidding the evil is the obligation of the imams, the sheikhs, the sayyids. It's their job to come and educate people when they see something wrong. Or it's their job to speak against the injustice that's going on. But the Quran says otherwise. The Quran says it's a duty upon every single individual in society. 
It's a duty upon every single believing individual, men, women, young, old, whatever you may be, you have that responsibility. You have that burden, that responsibility of making sure that life around you, those around you are comfortable. Those are not suffering. There's no oppression. There's no tyranny going on. Allah says in the Quran, وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ بَعْضُهُمْ أَوْلِيَاءُ بَعْضُ يَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ The believing men and the believing women, وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ بَعْضُهُمْ أَوْلِيَاءُ بَعْضُ They are awliya. You are close to one another. You have a bond that has made you close to one another. What is that bond? That is the bond of Iman. That is the bond of faith. إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً Allah says that the believers, they are like brothers and sisters. They are like siblings. So now, I have a responsibility to take care. I have a responsibility for the well-being of other believers, even if they're not my family. وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ بَعْضُهُمْ أَوْلِيَاءُ بَعْضُ You are awliya, you are the friends of one another. What do you do? يَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَنَ الْمُنْكَرِ If you see your brother, if you see your sister not doing something correctly, don't you have a duty to come and guide them? If you see someone suffering from something wrong going on in their life, don't you have a duty to come and teach them and guide them and show them the way? We all have that responsibility. We all have that moral duty. If I see someone in distress, I have to come and help this person. From an Islamic perspective, it's an obligation. The obligation of Amr bil ma'roof and Nahi an al munkar. Now, yes, sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it's not easy. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi says, Man ra'a minkum munkaran fal yugayyirhu biyadih. فَإِنْ لَمْ يَسْتَطِعْ فَبِلِسَانِهِ فَإِنْ لَمْ يَسْتَطِعْ فَبِقَلْبِهِ وَإِنَّ ذَلِكَ أَضْعَفِ الْإِيمَانِ He says, if any of you sees munkar, sees something wrong, you try to change it with your hands. If you couldn't change it with your hands, you change it with your tongue. You speak out against the injustice, against the oppression. And if you couldn't, then at least in your heart, in your heart, stand against it. Take that stance even in your heart. And then Rasulullah says, وَذَلِكَ أَضْعَفُ iman." That is the weakest of faith. Meaning, there's nothing further after that. At least in your heart, take a stance against the oppression, against the tyranny that's going on. Now, when it comes to enjoining the good and forbidding the evil, we see there's a lot of people that come and say, you know what, let people live their lives. Let me live my life. Let people do whatever they want to do. And who cares? People have the freedom. Let them do whatever they want to do. It's not my job to come and intervene and get, you know, involve myself in the lives of other people. And I don't want anyone else to involve themselves in my life. We always hear this. Sometimes you see people saying, oh, look at the haram police they came. Now they're telling people what to do and what not to do. My dear brothers and sisters, Islam says no. Islam says we have to speak out against the oppression. Islam says when you see anything going on wrong, you have to speak out. Because that is what your brother would want you to do. That is what your sister would want you to do. If they are suffering, if they are in distress, if they're not comfortable, wouldn't they expect you to come and help them? This is what Amr al-Ma'roof and Nahi al-Munkar is. It's helping someone who is unable. So there's a compassionate reason. This stems from compassion and mercy because we are all connected with one another. At the end of the day, we all have a duty towards one another. We all live in one society. We all live in one community. And I have a moral duty, a moral and religious obligation if I see my neighbor's house burning, don't I have a duty to go and turn off the fire? Don't I have a duty to go and call for help? Yes. Everyone will say that. Yes. If you see, for example, someone is going to hurt themselves because of what they're doing, don't you have a moral and ethical responsibility to go and involve yourself? Everyone will tell you, yes, you do. Same when it comes to religion. 
Same when it comes to akhlaq. Same when it comes to morality. Same when it comes to values. We have to. We have to involve ourselves. If I see someone suffering, if I see someone not doing so well, I have to go and try to fix the problems. I have to go and at least bring awareness. Let the person know that what they're doing is wrong. That's all. Now, if they want to accept what you're saying or don't accept, that's up to them. But you have a duty to speak out against the injustice. Why? Because you have a relationship. As long as they're mu'mineen, as long as they're faithful, you are brothers and sisters in faith. وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ بَعْضُهُمْ أَوْلِيَاءُ بَعْضُ And as long as that other person is a mu'min, a believer, then you have a moral obligation. You have a religious obligation towards that person. And yes, we have to intervene. Why? Because if we don't intervene, first we said we have a moral obligation towards other people. Second, anything that happens in society ends up impacting you once at the end of the day. Whatever happens, someone else is doing something that will come and impact you because we're all connected. We're all on one boat. So if someone is suffering, if there's a group of people in my community suffering from a disease, suffering from a problem, that will impact me, whether I like it or not. So this is why Islam says we all have a duty to speak out and enjoin the good and forbid the evil. And this is what is called Al-Amr bil ma'roof wa nahi anil munkar. Now my dear brothers and sisters, a few nights ago I spoke about the sins of the tongue. We mentioned ghiba, we mentioned namima, we mentioned backbiting, we mentioned these diseases of the tongue. You know what is one of the haram, one of the forbidden acts that also has to do with the tongue? That is leaving and not enjoining the good and forbidding the evil. That is one of the haram things. Your tongue, the haq, the right of the tongue upon you is that you use it to enjoin the good and forbid the evil. And it is haram, it is forbidden to see something wrong and not speak out. We have a duty. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he says, Kullukum ra." وَكُلُّكُمْ مَسْؤُولٌ عَنْ رَعِيَّتِهِ Every single one of you is a shepherd and every single one of you has their own responsibilities. We're all responsible. We all have certain things that we are responsible for. And at the end of the day, on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to ask us. Allah is going to hold us accountable. You saw this wrong in front of you. You saw this individual not doing something correctly. Why didn't you speak out? Why didn't you do your duty? We all have a duty to enjoin the good and forbid the evil. Now yes, if someone doesn't listen to you, if someone does not accept it, that's on them. But you have a duty, you have a responsibility to speak out against the injustice and the oppression that you see. Now, when it comes to Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahi al Munkar, a lot of people don't know how it works. A lot of people sometimes they see some wrong going on and they don't know how to come and speak to the other person, how to relay a message to the other person. Yesterday, we mentioned in our discussion, we talked about how to teach other people about the religion of Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this verse that we spoke about yesterday. ادعوا إلى سبيل ربك بالحكمة والموعظة الحسنة وجادلهم بالتي هي أحسن. Invite for the sake of your Lord with wisdom, with good admonishment, and if anyone is debating with you, debate in the best way possible. وجادلهم بالتي هي أحسن. But there are some restrictions and limitations to أمر بالمعروف النهي عن المنكر. It's not always واجب. Sometimes. You don't have to go out and speak against the injustice that you see. You don't, it's not always that you have to speak out. There are conditions. Scholars, they say that the first condition of Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahi al Munkar, in order to enjoin the good and forbid the evil, you have to know what the good is and what the evil is. Sometimes we find people, they want to be policing everyone else, but they don't know the laws, they don't know the ahkam. 
They're doing something wrong, but they're coming and they're telling people this is haram and this is halal, do this and do that, but they themselves don't know. No. You need to empower yourself with knowledge. You need to educate yourself. Then you will be qualified to enjoin the good and forbid the evil. Other than that, you're not able to. This is what ISIS was doing. ISIS, they come and, oh, this is haram. You're doing this. This is wrong. You're going to hell. You're going to heaven. And they, are, they don't know. They don't have a clue of the reality of Islam and the principles and the values of the religion of Islam. This is one. You have to know. Second, if someone does not listen to you, you know for sure that this person is not going to listen to you and this person will not be impacted whatsoever. Do you still have a duty to go out and tell this person? No. If you know, for example, someone doesn't believe in the religion of Islam, I come to this person and I tell him, why are you not praying? Why are you not fasting in the month of Ramadan? The person doesn't even believe in the religion of Islam. I have to start from the beginning. I have to tell them what the religion of Islam is and then I will be able to tell them about other things. So, if someone is not going to listen to you, if someone's not going to take what you're saying seriously, then you do not have a duty to enjoin the good and forbid the evil. This is one condition. That we said the first one is you have to know what the right and wrong is. The second one, there has to be a chance that the person is going to listen to you and accept what you're saying. Third, the one who is doing something wrong, if for example someone is making a mistake or someone is doing something wrong, this person, it shouldn't be a one-time mistake. It's when a person is insisting on the wrong. Sometimes you find some people, for example, I see someone in the month of Ramadan, they're breaking their fast. I don't know what the reason this person is breaking their fast. Maybe this person's traveling. Maybe this person is ill. Maybe this person has an excuse. So I can't go and immediately become judgmental and tell this person, why are you breaking your fast? Yes, if I know for sure that this person does not have an excuse, this person is just breaking their fast for the heck of it, then you go and you tell this person. But you have to first know what is, the, what is the circumstances of the other individual? The other issue is it can't do something haram. You can't do something haram to remove another haram. Sometimes some people, they see other people doing wrong, so they say, I want to enjoin the good and forbid the evil, therefore I'm going to be abusive. Therefore I'm going to talk about them. Therefore I'm going to backbite. Therefore I'm going to, you know, do a bunch of haram things because someone else is doing haram. It also doesn't work like that. Amr bin ma'roof and nahi al-munkar, if you want to guide towards the truth, you have to use the truth. You can't come and say, okay, whatever, whatever means possible as long as I, I gain that. No. You have to enjoin the good and forbid the evil in the right way. It is said that one day, Umar ibn al-Khattab, he heard that he was walking and patrolling the streets. When he was the Khalifa, he used to patrol the streets of Medina. So he heard that there was a man in his house, in his yard. There's a wall, there's a fence, and in his house, on the other side, he heard that there was sounds coming out. So he goes and he peeks. He peeks over the fence, over the wall, and he sees a couple of men sitting, and they have alcohol in front of them. They're drinking. So he is the Khalifa at that time. So he tells them, I caught them. He says, I caught them. I caught them red-handed. Where are they going to go now? They're drinking. They're drinking alcohol. So he jumps the fence, he jumps the wall, and he comes and he tells them, where are you going to go now? I caught you. They tell him, you caught us doing one thing wrong, but we caught you doing three things wrong. You caught us drinking, but you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَجَسَّسُوا Don't spy, and you were spying on us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أُدْخُلُوا الْبُيُوتَ مِنْ أَبْوَابِهَا Enter the homes from their door. You jump the wall. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when you enter upon a group of people, say salam. You did not say salam. So the people were probably drunk, but they were, you know, they knew their, their Quran verses. So Umar ibn al-Khattab, he tells them, okay, I'm going to leave you now. I'm going to leave you. And he left them. And this is, you know, this is a story that it's narrated in the Sunni books. And this story gives us example, it, it, it's an example and a lesson of enjoining the good and forbidding the evil. When you want to enjoin the good and forbid the evil, you have to do it in the right way. And if you don't do it in the right way, then you're going to take people further away from religion. You're going to take people further away from God. There's a, there's a system, there's a way of calling people and inviting people to the religion of Islam. Furthermore, if someone is doing something privately in their house, if someone is doing something wrong, it's not halal, something haram, but this person is in their house, do I have the right to go and expose the secrets of this person? Do I have the right to go out in public and say, yes, did you know what this person was doing? No. Because this person is doing something privately in their own home. And it's haram upon us to expose that person. It's haram upon us, even if that person is doing something wrong. It's haram upon me to go and expose that person and tell that person's secrets. Yes, if someone is doing something publicly, for example, posting pictures. They're posting pictures and it's public. They're allowing the whole world to see what they're wearing, what they're drinking, what they're eating, and everything. Then it becomes public information. Then here you have a duty, if they're doing something wrong, you have a duty to enjoin the good and forbid the evil. Now, my dear brothers and sisters, since we are in the month of Ramadan, and it's the month of reform, the month of social justice, and it's the time of the year where we reform ourselves, our personal lives, our families, our family, and at a society level. We have to make sure that we are constantly reforming ourselves. We have to make sure that if we see something wrong within our family, in our household, at the workplace, in our community, in our country, wherever we see something wrong, we have a duty to speak out. And if we see oppression, if we see people suffering, Islam tells us we have a religious obligation to speak out against it. If you see people, for example, suffering from poverty, if you see people having financial difficulties, that's also a responsibility upon us to try, to try our best to fix their problems, to improve their circumstances. Allah says in the Quran, "Fi amwalihim haqqun ma'loom lissa'ili wal mahroom." In our wealth, in your wealth, there's a haq, there's a right that does not belong to us. It belongs to those who are in need. It belongs to those who are marginalized. Those who are suffering, those who are hungry. We have to think of those who are in need. And if we see anyone suffering, if we see anyone is oppressed, we have a religious obligation to speak out. We have a duty, my dear brothers and sisters, to speak out. Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, he tells his sons, Imam al-Hasan and Imam al Hussein, in a will to them, he tells them, Kuna lil-dhalimi khasman, Always be the enemy of the oppressor and a supporter of the oppressed. As Muslims, we have a religious obligation to defend the oppressed, to defend those who are in need and never side with oppression. Allah says in the Quran, وَلَا تَرْكَنُوا إِلَى الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا فَتَمَسَّكُمُ النَّارِ Do not be with those who are oppressing, because the fire that burns them, it will also catch on to you. وَلَا تَرْكَنُوا إِلَى الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا فَتَمَسَّكُمُ النَّارِ So, just as we have the duty to enjoin the good and forbid the evil when it comes to religion, when it comes to faith, when it comes to our family, if we see oppression going on anywhere, we have to stand against it. And 
we have to take a stance. Sometimes, you know, a lot of people when they think of oppression, when they think of dhulm, they think of, for example, a country bombing another country, another country attacking and making an, another group of people suffer. That is oppression. But oppression is not limited to that. Sometimes oppression could take place in your own house. Sometimes oppression could take place between a husband and a wife. Sometimes oppression could take place between siblings. Sometimes dhulm and oppression can take place in a community, at the workplace, at school, bullying. These are all types of oppression. And we have a duty to speak out. Anytime you see any type of oppression, you have a duty to speak out against it. A few days ago, I spoke about um, the sins of the tongue and I said namima. So when I said namima, that's namima is described as you go to another person and you tell them that that person was talking about you, tattletelling. So someone thought that I said you shouldn't, you know, speak out against oppression because, for example, if, you, if someone did something wrong and you go and you tattletale, then that means you're covering up the wrong of that person. No, this is not what I meant. When it comes to oppression, when it comes to dhulm, you have to speak out. Even if that means you have to do ghiba. Even if that means you have to backbite. Because now there's oppression. Now there's dhulm going on. If someone is oppressing you, or if someone is oppressing someone else, you have to speak out or else you will be complicit of the crime or else you will also be held responsible something bad happened to another person something bad happened in the community don't speak out about لا يحب الله الجهر بالسوء من القول إلا من ظلم except if you were oppressed if you were oppressed then go and announce to the whole world if you were oppressed go and tell the world you have to you have to defend yourself and if someone else is oppressed, then you also have to defend that person. So anytime we see oppression, and there's oppression everywhere. It could be at a, at, in the school playground. It could be at the college campus. It could be in the workplace. If there's oppression, you have to speak out against it. And do not ever side with the one who's oppressed, with the one who's oppressing, and side with the one who is oppressed. Now, one issue I wanted to talk about, which is an example of oppression that is right in front of our eyes in this country, and that is the racial inequality that we are seeing. The prejudice and the racism that is very prevalent in this community and in this society, and something that the United States is dealing with until today and suffering from until today, the racial injustice and inequality as Muslims we know how it feels to be on the wrong side of the racial inequality and people judging you because of your faith and because of your values we know ever since 9-11 and before that Muslims have been the victims and until today Muslims are the victims of Islamophobia and this is something that continues and we have to speak out against it we have to take, make a stance and take a stance, speak out against it. Some people, they say, oh, I'm comfortable. Alhamdulillah, nothing has happened to me. Yeah, but there are other people that are not comfortable. If you are comfortable, then that means you're privileged. So that means you have a duty, an obligation to help defend those who are not privileged. To help and speak out for those who do not have. And there are other groups. There are other minority groups that are also suffering from racial inequality and racism and prejudice and arrogance. For example, after the COVID, we see that there's more hatred against the Asian community. We have to speak out against it. Just because some say, okay, we're not from that community. Do I also have to speak out against it? Yes, you do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, مَا لَكُمْ لَا تُقَاتِلُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَالْمُسْتَضْعَفِينَ مِنَ الرِّجَالِ وَالنِّسَاءِ Why is it that you do not fight in the way of Allah and those who are oppressed? Meaning that during the time of Rasulullah the Prophet would go out to battle. Why? 
not only for the sake of religion, but to defend the oppressed, to defend who, those who are marginalized. This is what Islam teaches us. To stand with those who are oppressed. And we have to defend them. Defend them with your words. Defend them by speaking out. Defend them by raising awareness. And another oppression that we see that is very prevalent is the oppression and racism against the black community. Which is something that is very prevalent in the United States. The systematic oppression and the brutality against one group of people. We heard about George Floyd, Dante Wright, Michael Brown, Ahmed Arbery. These are just some names of individuals who were killed because of the skin, because of the color of their skin. And it's very unfortunate to say that some Muslims, not only are they quiet, are they silent, but they are also complicit. Some of them, through their words, they allow the racism to continue. And this, my dear brothers and sisters, has nothing to do with Islam. Racism and Islam do not go together. According to the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he says, Man kana fi qalbihi mithqal khardal min asabiyyah ja'alahu Allah ta'ala yawm al-qiyamah ma'a a'rab al-jahiliyyah. The one who has the amount of a mustard seed of arrogance and racism in their heart, this person will be resurrected with the pagans before Islam because that's how they were living their lives. A life of arrogance where there was racism, where there was animosity against the minorities. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly says in the Quran, you won't find an ideology, you, don't, you won't find a book that stands against oppression and teaches equality between races as much as Islam does. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly says in the Quran, Inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa untha wa ja'alnakum shu'uban wa qaba'ila lita'arafu inna akramakum inda Allah atqakum. We created you from male and female and we made you nations and tribes. Why? So that you get to know one another. Not so that you hate one another. Not so that you build a wall and lock the other people out. Not because you say, I, I carry this passport and I'm privileged. I, I deserve to live better while the other, on the other side of the border has to live a miserable life. لِتَعَارَفُوا So that you get to know one another. And then Allah says, إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ In the eyes of God, Allah does not look at your skin color. Allah does not look at how much money you have in your bank account. Allah does not look at the car that you drive and the clothes that you wear. Allah does not look at these things. Allah looks at what's in the heart. إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ The one who goes to God with a clean pure, sound heart. إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَ اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ You have to have a sound heart. A heart that does not harbor hate. A heart that does not hold grudges and animosity against other people. Especially people just because of the, 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 the color of their skin or just because of the country that they live in. This is wrong. All religions stand against this. Not only Islam. All religions stand against this. And we have a duty to stand out against it. Even if we see other people. Even if the president is the one who's pushing racism. We have a duty to stand out. We have a duty to speak and voice our opinions. We have to stand and defend the oppressed. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu kunu qawwameena lillahi shu'adaa bilqist. وَلَا يَجْرُمَنَّكُمْ شَنَآنُ قَوْمٍ عَلَىٰ أَنْ لَا تَعْدِلُوا اِعْدِلُوا هُوَ أَقْرَبُ لِلتَّقْوَىٰ O you people who believe, be from those who stand for what's right. كُونُوا قَوَّامِينَ لِلَّهِ شُهَدَاءَ بِالْقِسْتِ Uphold what's right. Stand for what's right. This is what Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وآله used to do. You see any act of oppression, even if it's 
something very small. Even if it's something that's going on in a house between brothers, in a community, you have to stand out against it. And you have to speak against it. This is what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi did. Rasulullah, he came and he removed the inequalities within society. He came and he removed the racism within the community, within the hearts of people. Islam is not just a religion of worship. Islam is action. Rasulullah, when he migrated to Medina, there were two tribes, Al-Aws and Al-Khazraj. They were fighting with one another for decades. This is, I'm from the Aws and they're from the Khazraj. I'm from the Aws, they're from the Khazraj. That's it. They're all, they're both, you know, they're both human beings. And they're both living in one city. They're both Arabs. They're both, they're, they're the same. But just because one of them, their last name is Aws, the other one, their last name is Khazraj. They hated one another and they would fight. And so much blood was shed because of that. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi came and he united them. He came and he brought them to pray together in the masjid. Furthermore, Rasulullah not only united them, Rasulullah united all of Arabia. And not only all of Arabia. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi brought Salman al-Farisi. Salman the Persian. He came and he brought him in the community. And he says, Salman minna ahl al-bayt. Salman is from us, the ahl al-bayt, the family of the Prophet. He comes and he brings the Roman, Suhaib. He comes and he brings Bilal al-Habashi. Bilal the Ethiopian, the Abyssinian, who used to be a slave. He comes and he brings him. And he gives Bilal the, the position of calling for prayer. Where he was the spokesperson. Where he goes and he calls people to come and pray. Historians say that when Rasulullah conquered Mecca, he, he asked Bilal to go on the, on the roof of the Kaaba and call the Adhan. Call the Adhan. So these Arabs, they have just joined the religion of Islam. Some of them, they have so much arrogance and pride in their heart. They have just joined the religion of Islam and some of them because they had no choice, because they saw everyone else believing. That's it. They can't stay not believing in Rasulullah or not accepting, not submitting to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. They see Bilal going on top of the Kaaba and he's calling the Adhan. It is said that they began to speak. Some of them, they said, they said we are happy that our fathers died so that they do not witness a day like this. This is how much racism they had in their hearts. And this was a struggle that the Prophet had to deal with every day. Every day Rasulullah had to deal with. Bilal goes up and he's doing the Adhan. Instead of saying, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, he's not able to speak because he's not a, he was not born Arab. He says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. He says the scene instead of the, the sheen. So they come and they tell Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, let one of the Arabs, let one of the eloquent Arabs, let them come and do the Adhan. Rasulullah tells them, Sinu Bilalin Sheenun and Allah. When Bilal says Ashadu, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take it as Ashadu. Today we find within our communities, today we find within Muslim communities, today there's racism, there's bigotry. Some look down on another group of Muslims. Some look down on people from another country, from another community, and from another village. We have to. We have a duty to speak out. We have a duty to speak out against this. And we have to make our places of worship more inclusive. That allow everyone and give the opportunity for everyone to feel connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Otherwise, we will be doing an injustice to Islam. Because we are bringing our own cultures we're going to allow our own cultures to do an injustice to the religion of Islam because Islam is against racism. Islam teaches us to stand against racism and stand against oppression. And any type of oppression that we see, we have to stand against. My my dear brothers and sisters, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who enjoin the good and forbid the evil. 
We ask Allah to make us from those who stand and take a stance against the oppression. Any type of oppression that you see, stand against it. And voice your opinion because that is religiosity. نسألك اللهم وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم الأعز الأجل الأكرم يا الله يا الله يا رحمن يا رحيم يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على دينك اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات تابع اللهم بيننا وبينهم بالخيرات إنك مجيب الدعوات إنك غافر الخطيئات إنك على كل شيء قدير يا علي يا عظيم يا غفور يا رحيم أنت الرب العظيم الذي ليس كمثله شيء وهو السميع البصير وهذا شهر عظمته وكرمته وشرفته وفضلته على الشهور وهو الشهر الذي فرضت صيامه عليه وهو شهر رمضان الذي أنزلت فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان وجعلت فيه ليلة القدر وجعلتها خيرا من ألف شهر فيا ذا المني ولا يمن عليك من علي بفكاك رقبتي من النار في من تمن علي وادخلني الجنة برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين أعوذ بجلال وجهك الكريم أن ينقضي عني شهر رمضان أو يطلع الفجر من ليلتي هذه ولك قبلي تبعة أو ذنب تعذبني عليه وصلى الله على محمد وآل محمد صلوا على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد Thank you for that beautiful and enlightening lecture Sayyidina one of the things that you mentioned was helping those who are poor, whether or some people who, you know, whether spiritually, uh, through knowledge, or fiscally, monetarily, they need help. We have a hadith where the Prophet wasallam says that save yourselves from the hellfire, even if it is with half of a date given in charity. And if you cannot find that, then sa save yourselves by saying a good word. So the Prophet first, he says that, O oh people, save yourselves from heaven, from hell, by giving away meals. And the Sahaba, they say that, uh, well, you know, not all of us have the financial power to feed someone every day. The Prophet says that Allah grants this reward to a person who gives even a date a drink of water or a sip of milk to a person. So let us take advantage in these days of Ramadan to get this immense reward. And in fact, this Thursday, we have a potluck iftar at the masjid, 8.30 inshallah. We have the sign up uh, link on the Facebook. If you need it, I have it also for the people who are uh, in person. It's at the door where you sign up and then to, to bring a meal. And inshallah, your reward is with Allah. Uh, we also have a hadith on this topic where they, some, Imam Sadiq says that one of the things that, one of the things which gives one oblig, an obligation entrance into paradise and forgiveness is feeding a starving person. And obviously when we're fasting, we're all starving. So then he went on and, and the Imam starts reciting Quran. من موجبات الجنة والمغفرة إطعام الطعام السغبان That feeding a person who's hungry makes uh, heaven wajib upon you, makes it obligatory on you. So we have this Thursday, we also, we have the potluck at 8.30 and after we have suhoor with a scholar, our dear Sayyid, Sayyid Saleh, uh, at 11.30. So we have 8.30, we come for iftar, uh, we stay until uh, the program, and then after we have suhoor also. Um, 
let's send a fatha for one of the brothers in the community and all those who are suffering with the pandemic, those who are famine, you know, there are wars around, around the country, different areas around the world, there are wars going on. You know, I, I read a statistic a couple of days ago that 2 billion people in this world don't have access to clean water on a daily basis. And you'd think that after so many years, we've 2,021 years, at least after Nabi Isa, that still this water which is essential that some people don't have access. Two billion people. And uh, let us send the Fatiha for them. بعد الصلوات على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Reminder that uh, every night after the programs, if you, what did you learn? There are three questions that are posted on the Facebook. Uh, the link is bits.ly forward slash Ramadan uh, dash Y-O-W, Youth of Wisdom. So Ramadan dash Youth of Wisdom, Y-O-W. Three questions are asked, and inshallah, the people who uh, fill out the most of those questions after each one of Sayyid's lectures, at the end of the Ramadan, they'll be... Uh, they'll be put uh, for a chance to win a great prize and we'll conclude the program with a dua al-hujjah inshallah sallu ala muhammad wa ali muhammad allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ali bismillahir rahmanir rahim allahumma kun li waniyaka al-hujjah ibn al-hasan salawatuka alayhi وعلى أبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا وذليلا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد إن شاء الله we'll see you outside for refreshments and we see you tomorrow at 10 p.m. والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته